Welcome to the Internet History Podcast. I'm your host, Brian McCullough. Bruce Spector is another early web entrepreneur whose company would be acquired during the dot-com era. In this case, the company in question was WebCal, and the acquirer was Yahoo. Bruce later went on to spearhead Yahoo's acquisitions during the late 90s, including two of the largest, Broadcast.com and GeoCities. So in this episode, you'll hear the story of how Mark Cuban became a billionaire. Please enjoy this slightly belated episode, a conversation with Bruce Spector. Bruce Spector, thanks for coming on the Internet History Podcast. My pleasure, Brian. Uh, Bruce, where did you, where'd you grow up? I uh, grew up in New York City. Hmm? I am one of that uh, vanishing species, the native New Yorker. Well, uh, since we're here in New York, I'm curious, uh, what neighborhood did, did you grow up in? Well, uh, I guess the euphemism at the time was uh, we were poor, so we moved around a lot. I mm -hmm. grew up in Lower Manhattan and uh, Lower East Side and then moved to the Bronx for a while, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um and I, I feel like I've gotten several people that this has been true for right in a row here, but um, you didn't go to school uh, for tech or, or computer science or anything like that. Um, you, got a, you got a BFA. Um, you, were, you were studying art? That's right. Yeah, they, I basically can, can characterize my life to date as the first part of my life was spent as a fine artist, painter and sculptor. And this latter part as a kind of a different sort of artist, entrepreneur, and tech entrepreneur. I did the hard science that I studied uh, when I was at, I have a BFA, yes, and I also spent some time at Columbia studying astronomy. So oh. I have that much technical background. And, and art history and Asian studies, it looks like. It looks like you were all over the That's place. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so um, what, what year... Just to get the context, um, are you um, coming out of college? Oh, gee, that's uh, that's the Spanish Civil War, Brian. You know, that was <laughs> a long time ago. It was in the middle 70s. Okay, okay. So um, tell me a little bit about your career um, before you um, you land in tech and before before we get to WebCal. Like, what, just, just broad strokes outline of your career. Okay, well, I, uh, as I said, uh, was a painter and sculptor and uh, had always been interested in, uh, I guess, uh, new things and new approaches to things, and that included uh, my art. And at a certain point in time, I became interested in, uh, in film and uh, video, <clears throat> and that... Uh, coincided with the beginnings, I guess, of technologies approaches to that, which may not be thought of as technologies approaches to that, but uh, lined up coincidentally with the beginnings of MTV right. in, in the early 80s. Well, and also in the early 80s, video, <clears throat> video art as, like, as a movement was, was a big deal, too. Well, it's actually exactly how I, I entered. Um, I became interested in video, and uh, I've always been someone who wanted to have their own uh, working facilities rather than uh, than share them. Uh, certainly, after school, that was so. I uh, I set about totally naively to uh, to build a video studio, uh, and after about a year and a half of uh, buying things at auctions and wherever I could find stuff and putting it together. Uh, I had what turned out to be uh, one of the best equipped uh, artist video studios uh, facilities in uh, in the city, 
and that started to become known um, and other artists came by and video artists etc and I became part of that community and in order to make a living doing well art of that sort I found myself getting involved in commercial stuff and uh, my background my BFA <clears throat> turned out to have been in advertising and photography so I had some skills in that area so that all led to uh, my video studio my art video studio and that led into more commercial endeavors from uh, from my art studio if, if it's not uh, <laughs> if you don't feel bad about it uh, name drop some of the the people that you might have been working with some of the artists or anybody well I that? guess the the stellar video artist of the time that I became friends with was Nam Jim Peck and uh, and then there were a number of other people uh, less well-known at the time. And then in commercial work, I got involved with, as I said, uh, doing uh, music videos. Um, <clears throat> for a while, I was a manager of a, of a band, and uh, that got me into doing uh, music videos with them. And then because I had the studio, other of the early... Uh, of the early artists for music uh, started coming my way. So uh, some of the early rappers made videos in my studio. And, uh, and then I started doing some, I guess at the time we would call it uh, a newly arrived bit of fun technology, which if you're old enough to remember those days was called the video toaster. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So I was one of the first people to actually be using the video toaster live, as it turned out, as well as in post-production. And I did uh, dozens and dozens of videos at CBGB's in New York. Uh, Hilly Crystal was very generous. And we'd go in there most nights and record the bands. So uh, I have a library of, uh, of those recordings uh, now that, uh, that we're digitizing. Well, uh, if you don't mind name dropping some of the videos you might have worked on, some of the the, the acts that we recorded at CBGB. Oh God! <laughs> uh, how how can I put it? All of them? Okay. Uh, you know, uh, if you name a group of the of the day from the middle '80s to the late '80s, then uh, we we pretty much recorded them. So, like the the hair metal. Um, acts, or, or are we talking rap acts? No, uh, you know we're talking grunge. We're talking uh, like Pixies or Who's no, Who Do or anything like that. No, this was you know there were there were acts kind of before them. Uh, I'm, I'm you know I'm fuzzy on the dates, um, but if I were prepared, I could give you a list. But we were yeah. Don't on worry about it. Yeah, lots, lots of acts. Uh, yeah, I was just curious. Um, so, um, so you sort of, um, stumble into a career d doing this, um, through the art and, um, <clears throat> am I right? Does, does that take us through the eighties basically? Yeah. Well, what, uh, you know, what developed for me, uh, after that period was I was, uh, I was invited to, uh, to start building some, um, uh, state of the art, uh, facilities with, uh, with folks uh, in the city, as an example, uh, the School of Visual Arts in New York. Uh, David Rose, who was then the uh, the son of the founder and the president of SVA at the time, and I became friends. I was a teacher at SVA during that period as well. And uh, when the first Macintosh computers came out, that was 1984. Uh, I had the first ones of those and David visited me at my studio and uh, was turned on by it and we decided that we would uh, we would he invited me to build their a video facility at uh, at SVA so we did that and it was one of the first in the city and based on on uh, personal computers that is and then that led to uh, my being asked by a group of investors to develop 
further state-of-the-art facilities, which I did at New York University, and then uh, private facilities as well, which uh, which led to uh, an entrepreneurial venture that <clears throat> that actually has a a history that uh, is is fun to think about because it uh, I used to own the studio facilities that. Uh, John Stewart's Daily Show mm-hmm. and the Colbert Report were shot at on West 52nd Street. I used to live right over there, yeah. Did you? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, in the in the late 80s, from about 1988 to the early 90s, it was called Mega Media Center. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was one of my earlier entrepreneurial ventures. And uh, we shot interiors. We had large studio spaces, shot interiors for... Uh, Hollywood films like uh, the first Ghostbusters and uh, a number of other things. So uh, that was fun, and that was filled with uh, what was then state-of-the-art uh, computer graphics technology. And uh, it was still pretty primitive. And uh, after that, I was invited to be a part of uh, a more advanced facility, commercial television facility in New York and uh, in that facility I was able to introduce some of the state of the art technology then being created by Silicon Graphics in the early 90s I don't know how familiar you are with uh, well absolutely and, and, and listeners of the sh- of the podcast would be familiar because Silicon Graphics in the chapters on Netscape of course Jim Clark comes over from Silicon Graphics so we touched on how SGI, you know, basically made their name by power, creating powerful computers to do things like graphics and graphic design and things like that. Right. Well, I mean, I think they were seminal in um, in the creation of the platforms that uh, that became the uh, the standard for early computer graphics in Hollywood and uh, and in New York. I mean. Uh, it was the principal platform that the the computer CGI work for Jurassic Park, for example, was, uh, right. was done on, and uh, and Toy Story and some of the early uh, important CGI work was done on uh, on SGI platforms, and the uh, the arc of SGI was a you know kind of a live fast, die young arc. They, uh, they did very well, achieved a high pinnacle of success, uh, I guess the apex of which was doing things like Jurassic Park. And when, uh, when Bill Clinton was elected president, uh, the very first place he went to in Silicon Valley was, uh, was SGI. Mm-hmm. So it would be the equivalent of, uh, you know, a president going to visit Facebook or something. Google. Yeah. Facebook, right. Yeah. So they were they were big and and they did some remarkable technology. They had some of the best engineers in the world, literally the rocket scientists. Mm-hmm. So um, it's interesting because the the through line in everything that you're saying is is even though you know you're starting out as an artist, the through line that keeps popping up is the technology. You know, you're adapting to video technology, you're using early video toaster, and then now computer graphics. So somehow through all your work in the arts, it's always the the evolving technology and the new technologies that's sort of tying this all together. Well, I guess that's a, a characterization of my personality. You know, I, 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 I think of myself as a technology action junkie. Uh, as an artist, essentially, uh, I believe that... Uh, that everything boils down to uh, to process. You know, you essentially don't make a painting; you make paintings. You don't make a film; you make films. And the dynamic involved in doing that is is procedural. And the things that go into the process in uh, in the 1500s were oil paint on panel and canvas and the tools of the modern era today are computers and all things related to computers. So in effect, if you're going to be an artist in 
contemporary terms, then you are obliged to use the tools that are available. Do you remember um, uh, when you adopted, started to use the, the net and the web and things like that? Once again, early on uh, in the commercial web terms, um, if I went back a, a decade before where we are in my story, uh, as I said, in 1984 when the Mac came out, uh, a number of us early adopters in New York created something called the New York Macintosh Users Group. Mm. And uh, that it, you know, became a booming special interest group was this uh, was this on usenet or was it a bbs or what it... no this this was <laughs> this was a meetup oh okay it was meetups <laughs> yeah, right 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 <laughs> this was in in meet space uh the first meeting had about a dozen people at it and a, a month after that the next meeting had about 60 or 70 people and a month after that it had 300 and a month after that it had 2000 so we found ourselves in bigger and bigger venues and uh, you know that obviously that paralleled the arc of the success of the Macintosh and the interest in it. So uh, yeah, I think that uh, those kinds of those kinds of organizations start to seed uh, what happens afterwards. So um, tell me how how do we get to the point where you become a web entrepreneur? Uh, take us take us into the '90s. Well, in the in the uh, as I said, I, I basically transitioned once again, uh, liking as I do to be where the action is. Uh, I had been doing consulting work at uh, at NYU, uh, both on their computer labs and on their uh, computer video facilities. And uh, as such, I was introduced to a small group of researchers there. Um, and the group was called the Media Research Lab. Uh, and it was, a, if you will, it was a smaller version of the MIT Media Lab. And uh, I got friendly with the uh, developers there, with the research scientists, and they came from a variety of disciplines. And uh, one day I was sitting in the office of, uh, of one of them, uh, Troy Downing, um, and uh, I noticed that on his desktop, he seemed to be working on a calendar. Uh, and what was of interest to me is it seemed to be running in a, in a browser. Sure. And this was in a time before Netscape. So this was Mozilla and, and, and the more uh, roll-your-own kind of uh, browsers. And... Uh, and Troy said, oh, yeah, this is just a hack that I did to, uh, to do some uh, scheduling amongst the, uh, the folks in the lab. So I didn't think too much about it, but the idea of, uh, of a calendar uh, in running in a browser, anything, any application running in a browser uh, started to intrigue me. And I did some due diligence uh, for a month or two after that. And uh, although I really couldn't believe it, it seemed as if there really were no scheduling applications that were optimized for the web at that time. Mm -hmm. And obviously, this is this is still before. This is like nineteen ninety four, ninety five. Right. Uh, so this is this is before there's even email, you know, uh, web based email or anything like that either. Yeah, that was beginning as well. Right. Uh, but it was really in those very early times, uh, a couple of years before. Uh, the commercial web really started to uh, to emerge. So uh, I went back to Troy and suggested that maybe we try to build something commercial out of this, um, keeping in mind that uh, I was certain we would fail because uh, on the one hand you had uh, Lotus and on the other hand you had Outlook, mm -hmm. both you know desktop based. Uh, very sophisticated uh, personal information management, scheduling, et cetera. And I had no doubt that clearly one or both of those companies, Microsoft or IBM, had to be building something uh, for the web. Um, as it turned out, uh, they really weren't. 
at least not at that time. And uh, so Troy and I and a couple of other uh, folks uh, from uh, the Media Research Lab uh, set out on our own and started uh, WebCal for Web Calendar. And uh, over the next couple of years, we built it out, and it turned out, in fact, to be the very first uh, optimized personal information management system for uh, for the web. So uh, that's skipping over a bunch of details here that I'm curious about. So do you have any uh, programming knowledge at this point? Like when you say um, a bunch of people go off and do this, like who's who's the who are the people that actually code this together and, and, and make this happen? Well, primarily, I was essentially, you know, I had done some early coding when I was studying astronomy at Columbia, but uh, I was never a production coder. And uh, the folks that, uh, that built WebCal were three people principally, uh, all of whom had been at NYU. Uh, Troy, as I mentioned, was uh, was one of them, and uh, Raj, uh, his name is uh, Rajesh Rajodari, uh, and Eric Hickson, and myself were the principal uh, creators of WebCal and uh, the founders of it. So over the, as I said, over about 18 months, uh, the four of us built uh, what turned out to be a quite successful platform. As you heard there, Skype went into one of its periodic meltdowns. So we shifted to a landline and continued. Uh, picking up uh, where we were, um, you, had, you had named uh, the, the team members that basically had gotten together to, to launch this product. And um, is there anybody in this team that has a that has a previous background starting a company? I mean, you do um, from, you know, your entrepreneurial efforts in terms right. of studios and things like that, but had, had anyone no, else? No, not, uh, not really. No, Eric, uh, Eric Hickson uh, is uh, from a family that, uh, that has investments in, uh, in a number of companies. And so he had uh, the, uh, the background that came from, uh, from his family work. But no, there were no real entrepreneurial uh, folks. They were, they were uh, technical folks. They were computer scientists and, uh, and uh, developers. So if you, if you can remember, um, what, what are the main features of this first product that you launch? I mean, obviously it's a, it's a calendar like product, um, but taking it to the web, what, what did you want it to do? Um, basically do everything that Outlook can do, but then incorporate interactive stuff that the web would allow? What, what, what did the, uh, the first product look like? Well, it was essentially our notion, and it turned out to be in business and strategic terms, it turned out to be the big win for us. We effectively we're trying to do just as you've said uh, trying to create a set of functionality that uh, looked and felt to some degree like outlook or lotus notes and it was generally thought of as uh, personal information management so you had calendar function uh, functionality you had note taking function functionality you had uh, contact address book functionality those sorts of things in an integrated fashion uh, but what we didn't do and purposefully didn't do was to make what we were doing uh, running in a browser backward compatible so that it would also run on desktops. We chose not to do that for a couple of reasons. One, we couldn't afford to. That would have taken a great deal more uh, cycles in development terms to make it backward compatible. And the decision that I made was that uh, we had to make our bet on the future rather than the past. And not, uh, I think the reason that both Microsoft and IBM were behind the curve in, in that regard was that uh, they had to carry with it, uh, with any development into the new age of the web, they had to carry their legacy baggage along with them. Um, we didn't, uh, and so we chose not to, and as a result, what we chose to do was to optimize our code and optimize everything we were doing in terms of our UI uh, and UX 
to the new medium, to the web in general, to browsers in particular, and we were able to do that successfully. Um, do you remember uh, when WebCal actually officially launched or, or when the public would first be able to access this? Uh, that would have been 1996. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would have been in the spring of 1996. And we were, uh, we popped up on everyone's radar about a year later in the spring of 97. And uh, that was in a period of, uh, of the early aggregation by the bigger players of what they considered to be the kinds of application suites that they thought and felt they needed to, uh, to bring new users into their world. And so we popped up on the radar of every one of the big players at the time, uh, Microsoft and, uh, and Yahoo and AOL and Netscape. Well, a bit before we get to that, what, what, was, what was the user uptake that you saw? Like, um, you know, again, I'm not asking for specific numbers, but, um, you know, how, what was user adoption like? Well, you know, the, we had two uh, variants of what we were doing. We had uh, a personal information management suite running in a browser free of charge for individuals. And then we offered a, uh, an enterprise version as well that had a per seat price, if you will. And the adoption was, uh, was quick and uh, at the time relatively successful. I mean, you have to realize that we're not talking Facebook numbers because there were no Facebook numbers right. at that time. The numbers of users in 1996 were a relatively low number of, uh, of individuals. But businesses were very keen to get into uh, get into the newer technologies and uh, and collaborative technologies. So we had some early success there, and uh, and that started to spread the numbers of individuals uh, as well. Um, we hadn't mentioned this. It, had you taken any uh, venture capital money at any point, or was it always self funded? Well, what I like to say is our greatest financial success was the fact that all of the VCs said no to me. So, so you, you did try to... to... <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes, indeed. Yep. No, I met with many, many VCs, and all of them said no. So we wound up owning all of it. Actually, that makes me think parenthetically... Um, were there any VCs in New York at this point, or, or would you always have to go out to, to California? Pretty much always in California. There were, there were a couple of the, of the traditional, uh, long-standing VCs like the Rockefeller Fund and, uh, and a couple of others. Bessemer was here and a couple of other uh, high-end VCs, which were typically at that time uh, not startup VCs at all. You know, they were later stage. You know, actually, maybe I'm, I'm assuming too much. I'm assuming that you're, you're st still New York based at this point. Where is that true? You were in, in New York? I am. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, so now uh, another parenthetical that I'm interested in, um, you know, as, as things take off for you in 96, 97 for, for WebCal, that's also when the commercial web is taking off. So as a New Yorker myself, um, I'm curious to know what, <laughs> what was the, uh, the startup scene or the tech scene like uh, in New York City, I've spoken to you know double click people, other other early New York startups, but um, I'm curious to know what the startup scene in New York City was like in say '96, '97. Well, if you spoke to Kevin Ryan, then you know there were really just a handful of us. Right. <laughs> I mean, I've spoken truly. with Kevin O'Connor, um, right, Craig Canerick, a couple right. other, yeah, right, right. I mean, it, truly, there were just a handful of of uh, people in New York at the time. New York had had barely really begun in, 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 in what we see now as a very uh, vibrant startup community. That was, that was happening in the Bay Area. So back to, back to Web, WebCal then. So um, you have a, a completely self-funded and, and reasonably self-sustaining uh, business going with this um, 
this two-sided model that you described where free to use on the web, but um, business licensing and things like that. Um, and so then as you described, at some point, the the portalization starts to happen and, and Yahoo and MSN and Excite and, and all these places start to feel like they have to build out suites of services to to keep people coming back to their pages. So is, this is when you start to get the attention from, from those guys, right? That's right. Mm-hmm. And so... Um, what it, describe that for me? Are are you getting calls from everybody from Netscape to Microsoft to? What were actually my first question would be: Are you looking to partner with these guys? Like maybe that's another revenue stream that you could have developed. Is you know, uh, Yahoo Calendar powered uh, powered by WebCal or something? Well, Yahoo Calendar didn't exist right until they acquired WebCal. Right, right, right. But that's what so, my my question is: is are they coming immediately to, to acquire, or are, are they coming and you're hoping to do partnerships and things like that? It was largely uh, acquisition interest at that point in time. Uh, the history of, of acquisitions at that point uh, went something like this. The, the earliest suites to be acquired were email. Um, so you had uh, Hotmail being acquired in by uh, Microsoft, and then you had uh, Rocket Mail 411 mm-hmm. being acquired by Yahoo, and uh, and some others. So that was effectively the first wave of acquisitions with the uh, the email platforms. And shortly after that came other productivity acquisitions, of which WebCal was uh, was one. It was obviously an effort, as you've said, by the, the portals of the day to uh, expand their offerings um, in the hopes of capturing more uh, eyeballs. That's what the formula was then, and uh, I don't think that formula has changed in the 20, almost 20 years um, since then. It was about uh, getting eyeballs and keeping eyeballs. So who um, who from Yahoo uh, came according? Oh uh, well, um, I guess what happened originally is uh, we had some calls. As I said, we had calls from a number, if not most, of the of the major players of the time, and. Uh, um, we started. I started going to meetings uh, with them, and uh, and they all really uh, were happening at roughly the same time. They were all happening in the spring of, of 1998. Um, so we had meetings at Yahoo, at Microsoft, at uh, AOL, Netscape, and uh, and it was. The offers were made during those meetings, and uh, and then we had the decision to make as to which one to take, and that turned into really a decision based on on cultural fit, I think, uh, more than anything else. So you you felt like um, the Yahoo culture fit you. What what, what about it? Did you feel? Um, about the Yahoo culture fit what you wanted to do? Well, you know, my, my anecdotal uh, memory, if it serves, was along the lines of we would have a meeting that lasted several hours at, uh, at Microsoft, and, uh, and the first thing the senior person at that meeting said to me was, uh, well, you know, Bruce, we have uh, 400 engineers working on this problem. And my response to that was, well, why are we here? <laughs> you know, I mean, if you have 400 people working on this, surely you must have some great solutions. And, you know, that was kind of, that was, you know, that was a leading indicator of the culture. You know, it was an aggressive culture. And, uh, and, uh, and that really wasn't what we were looking for and uh, in contradiction i mean in contrast to that i mean 
we had a similar meeting at uh, Yahoo, and by the time that meeting was over, it felt as if we were all, you know, dorm mates at Stanford. And so the decision wasn't hard to make, all things being equal. Yahoo was the place to be. So Yahoo purchases WebCal in um, July of, of 1998. Did they... Did they make you guys uh, move out to California, or stay, were you allowed to stay in New York? Well, no, they they asked us to move uh, to California. That was uh, easy for Eric. He was in Palo Alto uh, already, and uh, and the rest of us uh, moved to uh, to California. So uh, you've kind of already done this, but um, uh, f- f- this is the history that I'm you know trying to capture here is. Um, if you could describe for me what what the working at Yahoo was like in in 1998, and and when you get to the Yahoo offices, you know there's the the, the stereotype of a, of a 90s dot com office, that sort of thing. But just your impressions of of the culture of the company and maybe the 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 time period as well. Well, that's actually easy and fun uh, to do. Uh, I think it was one of the most remarkable periods in the history of, of modern technology. And, uh, and we were invited to be a part of it, essentially at the apex of that pyramid at that time. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, I, I knew that, uh, that Yahoo would want uh, our developers, you know, Troy and... Uh, and Raj and and Eric, I I really didn't think they would have much use for me as a, as an entrepreneur. Um, But in negotiating the deal, uh, Jerry Yang and I spent a lot of time together and and Jerry, you know, among other things, one day said to me, "Uh, Bruce, uh, I want you to come out here and help us invent the future. And that's one of those proverbial offers you can't refuse. Right. And, and it turned out to be exactly that. Uh, you know, this was pre-Google, long about the same time as Amazon, uh, pre-eBay. Um, it was a time in which the future, certainly, of the commercial web was being invented being created. And I was offered a job that does, doesn't does exist at Yahoo, didn't exist at Yahoo after me, uh, that was, <laughs> Jerry Yang will tell you, was a uniquely wonderful place to be. Um, they had quirky titles at the time. Uh, some people will recall Jerry's business card read Chief Yahoo. Mm-hmm. And, rather and, than CEO, and Dave Philo's card read "Cheap Yahoo," right? Because he was the uh, meister of the bits that came in and out of Yahoo, and and my business card read "Turbo Yahoo," and I was the guy who was tasked with uh, looking out at the horizon and recommending what Yahoo might be interested in uh, partnering with in terms of technologies, ac- acquiring in terms of businesses, that sort of thing. And, uh, and at the time, it was the, it was the top of the mountain. Uh, I got to see essentially the entirety of the landscape of innovation at that time. It was phenomenal. I'm, I'm curious, uh, because you, you didn't have, you know, any kind of M&A background or anything like that. Why do you think, um, why do you think they chose you for that position? What do you think they saw in you that, that thought that would be a good fit? Well, I think you'd have to ask Jerry uh, that question. I, I mean, I know that their due diligence on me in terms of uh, when we were making our acquisition deal um, interested them because of my background in technologies associated with film and television, for example. So this was you know, well before YouTube. But, uh, but Jerry and senior management at uh, Yahoo, it was a very small management group, maybe 10 or 12 people at the time and, that I was invited to join. And, and they were keenly interested in things like how do we get into new technologies and film and television in web terms. 
And as an example, you know, within a year of the time I was at Yahoo, uh, Yahoo acquired uh, Broadcast.com. Uh, right. Well, and, I, I, we'll we'll go into that in detail, but I I mean I think you know Yahoo somewhat famously at that time always said that they they weren't thinking of themselves as a of, as a tech company, but more of a media company. So you're saying that when you come on board, they're already thinking in those terms, like the web is going to become a media destination. And so is, is it your remit maybe to, to find uh, where, those, where that's going to start sprouting up on the web? Well, I think they were interested in that among many, many other things. I think you need to think in, in the perspective of the time the way people think about Google today. Uh, Google is into many things. They're not just into web advertising. Obviously, they are the preeminent player in web advertising, and it's where most of their revenue and profits come from. But they're using that money to develop all kinds of innovative ideas. And Yahoo is doing something similar, uh, obviously on a smaller scale, but certainly innovative in a number of different areas. But yes, media was a very, very important area. Shopping was a very important mm -hmm. area. Um, I guess you could say things like uh, gaming. They were one of the creators and inventors of uh, fantasy sports. Mm -hmm. Those were areas of great interest to them. And as I said, they were inventing a future at the time that uh, they were inviting users to participate in, and people people were eager to be a part of that innovative process. So both on the developing side and on the consuming side. So it's really just sort of let a thousand flowers bloom, sort of thing. They didn't give you any specific marching orders. We want you to focus on this or that. They're, it's just kind of see see what's popping up and and what we can get involved in. Basically, that yes, largely that. Obviously, there were these uh, these threads. You know, there, as I said, there there was a thread of interest, great interest in media, great interest in uh, in shopping, great interest in a number of leading threads. But yes, it was really one of those. Uh, let's look at let's look at the idea landscape and uh, and see what we can pick and see what we can develop. Well, then let's. You know, Yahoo was a place where they wanted to develop as much as they wanted to acquire. Right. So it wasn't just looking for things to acquire. Well, let's let's tar talk about some of the specific things. Um, were you uh, were you involved in Yo Yo Dine, or would that have been too close to around the time that you were acquired? That was about the time we were acquired. Okay. I think, if I'm remembering, they came within a month or two of our acquisition. Um, so then let's, let's talk about broadcast.com. Um, like, so how does something like that get on your radar and, and how do you go about the process of, of acquiring broadcast.com? Well, that was a fun ride, uh, I would have to say. Um, as I said, it started fairly shortly after I, uh, was part of senior management at, at Yahoo, and in that, Yahoo had made an early investment before I was there uh, in uh, what was then AudioNet before the name change. Right. And uh, <clears throat> and uh, Mark Cuban and Todd Wagner had created AudioNet, and I'm, I'm sure you know, if not your users, that it was created based on a desire of Todd saying to Mark one day, both uh, alums of Indiana, uh, how come we can't listen to basketball games out here in California? Or they were at the time they were in Dallas. And uh, Mark thought that the technologies were such that that could be developed uh, on the web. And they went ahead and did that. And Yahoo had put an early investment into that company. And so they were aware, clearly, of what uh, AudioNet was doing, and AudioNet had developed fairly successfully over a couple of years, and uh, and then went public. And uh, their public offering, uh, historically, was, I believe, uh, the biggest first day bounce up to that time mm -hmm. on uh, on Nasdaq. 
and uh, it was really, I guess you'd have to say, the beginning of the bubble, of what became the bubble. And uh, all boats were rising, if you will. So shortly after the public offering, uh, that happened, I think, within a week of our acquisition uh, deal. Mark came out to, uh, to California, and he and I met, and he wanted to see Broadcast.com become a part of Yahoo. And I became the, uh, I guess I became the evangelist for that deal. And uh, it took a while. It took uh, almost a year uh, to actually close the deal. And by the time it did, uh, it was the largest acquisition that Yahoo uh, had made to date. I think it might even still be the largest acquisition they've, they, they've made. Um, yeah. The, uh, yeah, because it was uh, five point something billion. Um, so first, first of all, so you're saying that um, immediately, right after the his IPO, um, Mark Cuban is interested in in selling the company to Yahoo. That's correct. Yeah. And so it, it takes a year to get the deal done. Is that is that because uh, Cuban drives a hard bargain, or, or what, what were those sort of discussions like? No, I think it was just uh, it was just a time that Yahoo was uh, very intensely busy on that level. There were many deals in the offing. There were a number of things on the runway for them to to uh, to be concluding and working on, and and. Uh, the broadcast deal was uh, certainly the biggest of them, but it was among a number. Um, and uh, and there was a lot of due diligence in terms of uh, how this was going to go and what it was deemed to be, uh, how it was, how it might be integrated, what would be happening, who would be part of it, all of that. So it took a while. Well, and we should we should also note that you know Yahoo is able to suddenly do deals of, of the size of five billion dollars because as the bubble is happening and the the tide is rising all boats, Yahoo is chief among them, being one of the That's highest correct. flying stocks. So they have this stock currency to to go out and make large deals like this. That's right. And That's exactly right. On mm-hmm. a on a personal level, was that a little? <laughs> Was that a little daunting where all of a sudden you're involved in $5 billion deals and have all, all these resources behind you? Well, I mean, it, you have to really, I mean, it, it was a heady atmosphere, let me mm. put it that way. It was the kind of atmosphere in which you you could believe, I mean, uh, I would I would be among those who would raise their hand at almost any meeting for an acquisition saying, yeah, let's do this, let's buy them. You know, we were we were basically printing money in terms of the uh, the ascent of Yahoo's share price, uh, along with others, and so we were in a position to uh, to do quite a lot. And uh, and I think that the hope, uh, you know, in terms of a shoulda, woulda, coulda. Uh, in analogy would have been that the broadcast would have been YouTube before YouTube, and that uh, sadly didn't happen. Well, let's let's talk about another deal that you probably were involved with uh, that would be of interest to our listeners, uh, which would be um, GeoCities. Uh, we've we've spoken with David Bonnet. Um, I'm same sort of question. Um, how did GeoCities get on your radar. Um, how did how did that deal come about? Well, that deal I wasn't directly involved in that. Mm. I was only uh, uh, tangentially involved in that. But I think it was, as I've described, the the the, uh, the process and the dynamic of the time across the board, not just at Yahoo, was to acquire users was to get eyeballs and to the other jargon term of the day was to make uh, those users sticky, which meant make the apps sticky, make the environment sticky, so people would become regular users and, and, uh, and loyal users. 
And GeoCities, of course, was among the early social network uh, plays. Uh, had, had done that. I mean, uh, effectively, what everyone was buying then and what everyone is continuing to buy now, uh, you know, it isn't, it, it isn't uh, a coincidence that, uh, that Facebook pays $19 billion for, uh, for WhatsApp. Right. It's because they had a very large user base and a growing user base. And back then, the very same kinds of uh, rules were being applied. So if your company looked like it was growing and had a significant number of users, uh, then, uh, then Yahoo was interested. And uh, GeoCities fit that bill. And uh, once again, the issues that come after that are how well do you actually integrate acquisitions. And there's a long history of poorly integrated acquisitions, not just at Yahoo, but across the corporate world. Um, so yeah, looking at the, I, I brought up a list of, of Yahoo acquisitions at this point. There's things like Encompass. There's a, a couple like, uh, internet service providers, uh, online anywhere is, uh, early content delivery network, I think. And, um, right. some e-commerce plays like, uh, Arthas.com. And, um, so it, when looking at that list, you can see that they're also, you know, it's it's infrastructure stuff. It's making sure that you know, right? What Yahoo is doing can evolve with the with the scale with the audience. Right, and that was obviously that is one of the very most important parts of growing uh, an organization um, of any kind is certainly one that was having to be technologically improving daily, if not hourly. Um, the infrastructure was constantly uh, a very important part of uh, of the development of, of, as I said, not just Yahoo, but if you look at the acquisition portfolios of uh, of most of the internet giants, you're going to find uh, that they're dominated by infrastructure acquisitions. If not, you know, the infrastructure developer talent themselves, uh, the companies that were that were building infrastructure. Um, so. You're only with Yahoo for uh, two or three years. I think you leave in, in June of 2000. And actually, it's seemingly a lot of the early Yahoo people leave all around that, that same time, kind of. Um, I'm curious to know um, uh, w your decision to leave. Um, did you want to get back to New York, get back to art, or, or what, what was involved in that decision to leave Yahoo? Well, I, you know, I, I'd have to say that I'm... I'm not personally a fan of larger organizations. Mm -hmm. I prefer to be a part of a small group, a small team working on, on innovative stuff. And Yahoo was at the time, you know, when I joined Yahoo, there were roughly 400 employees. And within a couple of years, there were 11,000 employees. That's the kind of growth that uh, that I was a part of, that I saw, uh, and uh, that becomes a difficult management problem. And I felt, for me, uh, I my preference was to uh, was to be a part of uh, something small and innovative rather than something uh, large and innovative. So I uh, and I wanted to come back to New York. I, I was not going to be uh, an expat in San Francisco. I, uh, I preferred New York. So back we came. Uh, before we leave Yahoo, I'm just curious um, for your impressions of, of Jerry Yang and, and working with him. I love Jerry. Uh, you know, I think that he's uh, a really innovative personality and a really forward-thinking personality and a very, very, you know, I, I'm not, I, I have no reason to, to gush over somebody I haven't seen in a long time, but Jerry was a generous person and a generous manager and, uh, and uh, a good guy. I like Jerry. So um, 
you come back to New York and um, what, 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 what do you get up to when you come back here? Uh, raising children mm. is what I got up to. I had toddlers then who were, when we got back to New York, they were five and seven years old, two boys who climbed every tree and every lamppost and every jungle gym anywhere in New York. And uh, I happily was in a position to be there for them and present uh, at that time. So I spent some time doing that. Uh, well, I spent some time from then till now doing that. And, uh, and I also started developing uh, some more software, some more web software here in New York and uh, investing in some other companies. And uh, now I am, you know, once again, tech action junkie as I am, I'm involved in uh, developing mobile apps and uh, mobile technologies. Right. Tell me, tell me about BuzzVote. Well, BuzzVote, I, you know, is an idea that I've had for quite a long time, and uh, and it's now implemented uh, successfully uh, as a platform running across, uh, you know, essentially ubiquitous uh, distribution across desktop and mobile and tablet, and you can pretty much get to BuzzFeed from anywhere. And it's designed at present to be what I call a uh, a social polling slash viral voting application platform. And it consists of curated content polls and questions um, that our editors produce, and it also uh, enables uh, user-generated content as well. So you can go to BuzzVote and create your own polls. And uh, that, I, my own personal sense of, of engagement is that uh, you hear and read all the time about apathy in relationship to politics, in relationship to people and citizens, relationship to government, not just here, but in many places, and, and a kind of a negative feeling about about voting, and I, I would like to counter that, and I think the way to counter that, especially in the world we live in, is all of us essentially are, in way, one way or another, voting hundreds of times every day, from you know, what kind of coffee they drink in the morning, to what kind of TV show is their favorite, to what movies they watch, what music they listen to as well as whether or not they vote in any political environment. And I think that there's an opportunity to create a platform for voting in much the same way that there was a, an, a, there was a need to create a personal information platform back when we were doing WebCal. So that's the approach that we're taking uh, with BuzzVote. It's casual at this point, and at some point it may be developing into uh, into a more formal way for people to actually cast meaningful votes in meaningful ways. And you can uh, you can also find BuzzVote and and the Apple App Store and and Google Play as well, right? Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, um, Bruce Spector, thank you for uh, coming on the show and uh, remembering all that for us. Uh, you're only the the second Yahoo person we had the chance to talk to, so. I, I'm happy for that, and, and I, the, the, the story of, of WebCal was fascinating, so thank you. Thank you very much for having me, Brian. It was a lot of fun. If this is the first time you're listening to this podcast, please subscribe to us on your podcast app of choice. There's plenty more great internet history where that came from. And if you're a longtime listener, then you know what to do to help us out. Rate and review us on iTunes because iTunes gives credit to reviews and ratings, and the more great reviews we get, the more people will discover us. As always, there's more info on our website, www.internethistorypodcast.com. The show's Twitter handle is at nethistorypod, and my personal Twitter is at brianmcc. Thanks for listening.